Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is Sea Raptor, and today it is a long past time. We finished up a look at the Japanese torpedo centric destroyers by taking Gander at Tier 10's Shimakaze. That's right, Lay, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about what is arguably the most famous, infamous? What does that mean, infamous? Oh. <laughs> infamous is is when you're more than famous yep we're gonna go with infamous based on that definition ship in all of the japanese destroyers shibikaze of course one of the original destroyers in world of warships um launching with the game way back in 2015 she was one of the original two tier 10 destroyers players could obtain it was either gearing or shimikaze and we already had a look at gearing now we're going to have a look at Shimikaze. And Shimikaze, over the years, has maintained a very fearsome, and I'd say very appropriate, reputation. So let's talk about um, why that is, what she does well, what she doesn't do well, and we're going to spend some time talking about how she struggles in the current, uh, the current meta of World of Warships and kind of why that is. It's something that I sort of haven't touched on when going up the rest of the, the, the line. But I think now that we're here at Tier 10, I think it's worth understanding that there are going to be... It's worth explaining. It's worth discussing, right? That simply because of the, where, the way World of Warships is, uh, has, has evolved, right? That there's going to be games that you're going to take this boat out and you're going to be insanely disappointed. And there's sometimes very little you can do to impact that. You're going to be able to just, you're going to have to do what you can, but you're going to go home with some caps and some, some spotting damage and 40,000 damage and a win. And you're going to have to just be happy with that because a lot of the things that used to make Shimakaze uh, very, very strong have sort of kind of, it's hard to explain. We'll talk more about it in a minute. Okay, let's look around the ship. Like we do, starting with survivability, you see there Shimakaze, 17,900 HP. That is a base. I am currently not running survivability expert on this captain. So that is her base health. I've sort of done here what I did down at tier eight with Kagero. This is a choice. Um, if you feel like you want survivability, survivability expert, man, you go right ahead. You are probably never going to regret that decision. And this is a risk, right? And we talked about why it was a risk at Kagero and why it remains a risk here at tier 10 to not take that skill. You're going to run into a lot of radar. You're going to run to 10 kilometer radar, uh, the occasional nine kilometer radar, uh, the occasional 12 kilometer radar, right? So there's going to be times that, or planes, right? You're going to be forcibly spotted at times. And so that extra health, just keeps you in the game just that much longer. And here, not taking it on Shimakaze is an intentional choice that I have made. And we'll talk more about why that is and why you might do the same thing later on. But 17900 is base. Now, how does that compare to most of her contemporaries? It is really bad. <laughs> it is really bad, right? The only destroyer, the only tier 10 destroyer with less health than this is uh, the American version of Shimakaze, and that is Tier 10 Premium USS Summers, which is a ship that is very... I don't even, I don't even think you can obtain that ship anymore. She has a few hundred less health than this. Um, just ahead of this ship is Yu Yang. Just ahead of that is Holland and Vampire Deuce. Just about every single destroyer in Tier 10 has 20,000 more hit points or more. And you are running 10% below that. There are tier 10 destroyers now. If you go look at the ship like Elbing, which is essentially a, a little tiny light cruiser take, filling out a destroyer spot, that by the time you buff out an Elbing, it will literally have twice your health pool. So this is a huge, um, I won't say balancing factor, but I will definitely call it a negative. This is a huge negative of the ship that you're going to have to work around. Survivability expert's probably the best you can do. If you have your Yamamoto captain, um, I think maybe he gets a little bonus to this. I forget where he does and doesn't for the health. But um, there might be some Japanese captains that get some, some you know, the extra buff to this skill. You can get it, you can eke a few extra hit points out of it. But the bottom line is, is that you're going to be constantly fighting your health pool. All right. Now, nothing you could really do about that. Your health pool is, is, is one of the ways that Wargaming balances the ship. They control that number. And this is what you've got. So you better learn to play around it. Um, and like I said, you can decide on your own if you want survivability expert or not. Now, one of the reasons her health pool is what it is, is because of her maneuverability and concealment. Her concealment coming in at 5.6 means that Shimakaze is basically tied for best in tier detection. The only other tier 10 destroyer that can 
get down to this level of stealth is her other OG, Tier 10 American US Destroyer USS Gearing. As we talked about in the old gearing video, if you take a unique upgrade or a legendary gearing, depending on how you want to, how, however you want to phrase it, right, gearing's detection will also come down to 5.6 kilometers. No other Tier 10 destroyer can get this low. Not at present. Uh, you have to look outside of this matchmaking bracket, well, in your matchmaking bracket, but outside of your tier to find ships that beat you, right? And the two predecessors in this line, Kagero and Yugumo, are stealthier than this. So Shimakaze has excellent stealth, but there are still occasional things that will outspot her. Generally, it's by no more than a few hundred meters. So we're not talking like it's a huge disadvantage of the ship or something. Um, but inside of just her matchmaking bracket, this is as good as it's going to get, right? Just about everybody else starts at about 5, 8 and goes upwards from there. There's a, there's a fair chunk of 5, 8, 5, 9, and 6, 0 ships. And then as you start getting into the Russians, the French, the German spa cruisers and stuff, you're getting into uh, seven, you know, six, six, you know, high sixes, low to mid sevens, that kind of thing. So you have a huge spotting advantage, which is good because as we just got through talking about, your health pool is crap. So We've talked about it many times in this line, but as, as you get to the top of the line, it's more critical than ever that you maximize your spotting advantage. You do not accept engagements. You do not court engagements where you do not hold an advantage. You do not hold all the cards to, come on, to, to walk out of that engagement with your ship intact. Um, you just have to be very, 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 very cautious with this, with this health pool. The good news is your stealth should give you the ability to do that, and you've had plenty of opportunities as you've ground up the last two ships in the line to learn how to manage this stealth to your advantage. I would not encourage you to jump over those ships and go right to Shimakaze. You need to play Kagero and Yugumo to learn how to use this stealth correctly before you get to Tier 10, or you're going to be disappointed. I'm telling you right now. Okay, maneuverability. This is a huge asset of this ship. This is a good thing. You see there with a speed flag, um, Shimakaze uh, tops out at 41 knots. That is just her base chugging around. I do whatever I want speed. Her base speed without a speed flag. Let's have a peak, 39 knots and change. So that's really nice. Like that is, that is solid. That is not best in tier because of course, the French still exist because, of course, the Russians still exist because, of course, the Italians still exist. But the bottom line is, is that other than those three nations, you are faster than pretty much just about everybody else. Well, I technically, technically, Avaro de Passan is also about this faster, a little faster. So if you're up against Kleber, Marceau, um, uh, uh, Delny, uh, Kronstadt, I mean, sorry, not Kronstadt, uh, Habarovsk, um, and uh, Attilio Regolo, Arvaro de Bazan, like all of those super speedy gunboats, they are faster than you. Everybody else in the tier, you are able to use your speed to open the range to stay away from them. So this is huge, right? This is a big, big advantage of this ship. You, between the speed, the detection, it's one of the reasons the health pool is, is what it is. So keep this in mind. You're going to want the speed flag. You're going to want the speed boost. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute, okay? Turning Circle 960 is not amazing. Certainly not best in tier, but far from worst. The ship will handle a little worse than Yugamo, and it's because she's longer, right? We've gone from double launchers to triple launchers. The hull is lengthier as a result, and so that extra length works against you with a larger turning circle. You're just going to have to kind of learn to live with it. Rudder shift's still pretty good, though. Three seconds. Main battery. You're used to singing this song. I've got a triple, uh, excuse me, a triple battery here, a double-barreled turret. Uh, one, these uh, ubiquitous now Japanese 127 50 caliber guns, a single turret up forward, and a super firing turret back aft. Reload now down to 5.7 seconds. Um, Shimakaze is never going to be a gunboat. It's just not what she does. It's not her forte. Does that mean that you should never use the guns? No. I feel like I've explained that ad infinitum, ad nauseum, as we have gone up these various videos in the line, but I'll say it again for emphasis one more time in case you haven't watched those other videos. Know when to use your guns. Know when to not use your guns. This gun is, this ship is never going to be a gunboat. There, I've heard people talk about LOL gunboat Shimakaze build. Yeah, you can build this ship as a gunboat. But dear God, why? Like, if you want a gunboat tier 10 destroyer, there are a trillion better options than this. Don't do it. Just don't do it, right? Be the anti-Nike. Just don't do it, okay? And so um, use the guns when necessity arises, when you have the opportunity to finish off low health targets, when you can close out opposing ships with a couple or three salvos from your guns, most commonly opposing destroyers or submarines, 
That's what those guns are good at. They're excellent at it. They're so good at it. You don't want to be sailing around trying to farm damage off of battleships with your guns, right? That is not... Can you? Yeah, but you don't want to be doing that. Like, that's going to get you dead. Any battleship player with two brain cells to rub together is likely going to shoot at you, given the opportunity. So don't do that. Now, you see there, 11.4 kilometers on the range. I believe that is probably with... Um, okay, there is no range mod. So unlike the tier 8 and 9 ships where you actually had a choice, you could voluntarily lower your gun bloom bubble. You cannot do that here at Shimakaze. 11.4 is the only range you can get on these guns, and that is just the way it is. So nothing you can do there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the guns are good, like we've been saying. The, 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 the alpha damage is, the, is, the, uh, is the, the, the play here. Now, what we've been saying up to this point is, you know, kind of... Uh, Best in tier HE, alpha damage, worst in tier DPM. Here at tier 10, you really can't say that anymore, right? There are so many pure gunboats uh, that the alpha strike, the alpha damage is no longer um, the top notch, right? Haberovsk's um, HE alpha is higher. Um, Atelier Regolo with the SAP, her alpha is higher. And so is uh, Alvaro de Passam. All three of those ships have a higher alpha strike potential out of their guns. What do those three ships not have? They don't have stealth. They don't have any stealth. All three of those ships, you can see from several kilometers higher away, farther away than you can with Shimakaze. So you have a very, very good HE alpha strike, um, and you do still have, let's see, I, is it really worst in tier DPM? I'm checking. Um, no, it's actually not, but it's definitely on the low end. This HE DPM is nothing to write home about. Um, so your alpha strike is not best in tier. It's still very, very good though. And, um, and of course the French also put, 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 put you to shame a little bit, but you, so you don't want to be in an extended gunfight. If you get into a gunfight in the ship, you want it to be two, three salvos, then get out. Hopefully you've killed whatever's spotting you run away, smoke up, find some cover, whatever. Torpedoes. This is really why you're here anyway. So let's have a talk. Okay. Shimakaze, of course, is built around three of the quintuple launchers here, all amidships fitted in around her stacks and just forward of her after superstructure. This is the meat of this ship, right? This is the bread and butter. This is why you take Shimakaze, these launchers right here. For starters, you have access to not one, not two, but three different types of torpedoes. Okay, if you remember down at Yugamo, you had access to these same, th almost the same three types. You could get the 10 kilometer torps that you had at, you had at tier eight. You could get the F3s and you could get the 12 kilometer torps. Shimakaze here offers you her stock condition is what sometimes people jokingly call the noob tubes. Okay, the 20 kilometer torpedoes. These are very good torpedoes in the right case usage case. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The, 12, the exact same 12-kilometer torpedoes you had access to down at Tier 9 that you probably played a lot of at Yugamo, the Type 93 Mod 3s, and of course, the more dangerous, the high-risk, high-reward Japanese F3s that we talked about down on Yugamo are also available here as well. If you want to you you go that route, hey, these are here for you, okay? So, let's talk about why you might choose each of these three torpedoes. For starters... We've talked about the 93 Mod 3s. You're probably very comfortable with these coming from Yugamo. This is a very, this is what I would consider to be quite, kind of, it's not the base configuration of the ship. When you first unlock Shimakaze, you have to spend XP to unlock the, the 12 kilometer torpedoes. You're going to start with the 20s, but I feel like if you're just a brand new Shimakaze player and you just picked up the ship for the first time, spend the free XP or play a couple of games and add some free XP, whatever you got to do, Unlock the Type 93 Mod 3s while you're learning the ship. Personal opinion. Because you're used to this, right? This, th with these torpedoes equipped, Shimakaze plays like a more capable Yugamo. And you just came from Yugamo. You're very used to that ship. That This will kind of let you settle into the matchmaking, the kind of opponents you're going to see, the kind of decisions you're going to have to make, and so on. From there, you can decide if you even want to spend the XP to unlock the F3s. And maybe you didn't even down at Yugamo. Up to you. Or you might occasionally want to go back and grab the 20 kilometer, uh, L, you know, the, the 20 kilometer long lances, the LOL, the noob tubes. The Type 93, of course, is the traditional Japanese long lance. Now, what's the difference between these two torpedoes? Well, for starters, the Type 93 Mod 3s uh, have less range, but they hit harder. They are also less detectable. They are harder to spot once they can be spotted by uh, opposing ships. Once they're spotted on the surface, you see that little 1.7 kilometer detectability range. That's how far out opposing ships will see them coming in. The long lances go a lot farther, and you can see there from the, the, the updated on the HUD, they only move, um, they move a little slower, 
They're much easier to spot. Um, they reload just a little longer, right? Um, they're oh, sorry, just a little faster, just a hair faster. Um, and they hit just a hair less hard. You will find Shimakaze players who swear by the 20 kilometers. You'll find Shimakaze players who swear by the 93 Mod 3s. You'll find Shimakaze players that swear by the F3s. There is no wrong answer. This is going to come down to personal preference. Whatever you are most comfortable with, or sometimes, depending on what environment you're taking the ship into, if clan battles are tier 10, and you know you want the long lances because you want the range, then you're going to take the long lances, right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to grab the 20-kilometer torps. Um, when you watch competitive warships, like I've called many, many games of King of the Sea that have a Shimakaze in them, there's always that constant question of, is he running the 20 kilometers? Is he running the 12 kilometers? Um, some of that depends on how the ship is positioned. Some of that depends on how the team intends to use it. Both of, all three of these are, are valid choices. I'll say, I still feel like in random battles, the F3s are high risk, high reward. I would not do this in random battles very often. Personal opinion, personal choice. Okay, if this works for you and, they, and you love these things, hey, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Go to town, have fun. In my mind, for traditional, I feel like playing this ship, I'm going into a random battle. You're going to want to basically, your choice is going to be 20s or 12s, and I'm going to leave that up to you. In randoms, it's hard to make this call. In, in a con more controlled environment where you know consciously what map you're going to zone into, it's much easier to go, oh, I want the 20s, right? Some maps in the game, certainly a lot of high-tier maps in matchmaking, are very, very bad for the 20-kilometer torpedoes, right? 20 kilometers is a long way. Sometimes there are vast swaths of territory that you can't fit torpedoes that run 20 kilometers through on certain maps, and... These are just, the, the long lances are just not useful. You want the 12s because you're going to have to get in closer to get the work out of them. There are certain maps where the absolute reverse is true. Big, huge swaths of open water, 20 kilometer torpedoes are amazing. I'm looking at you, ocean, right? But in a random battle, you don't know what you're going to get. So you have, to, you have to kind of build the ship the way you want to build it and then, uh, and then figure it out from there. Um, other than that, you're pretty solid. Like, there's just there's a lot to like about these torpedoes. Now, the other big kind of detriment is that they're quintuple launchers. And because they're quintuple launchers, that means that they reload very, very slowly. This is, unfortunately, one of the ways that Wargaming calculates torpedo reload is based on the number of tubes in the launcher. And being a quintuple launcher, one of the only quintuple launchers here at Tier 10... Well, I say one of the only, but there's actually quite a few of them around. But these these take forever to reload, right? The base reload on these with the with the 12 kilometer torps in them is nearly three minutes per launcher, nearly three minutes per launcher. Crazy lunacy, as I like to say. So if you're going to run a torpedo sentry destroyer and you're going to lean into the torpedoes, you're going to have to be looking for every advantage you can get to get those torpedoes into the water as quick as you can and speed that reload up. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Depth charges. You're Japanese. You've got a lot of really good depth charges. If you quarter a submarine, you will murder him. You're putting 16 bombs in a stick down now. Each one of those bomb hits for the next bombs hits for the next specs thing to 5k. And yeah, like if you quarter a submarine, this guy is going to regret his life choices. This is a highlight of the Japanese destroyer line. It's one of the things that makes their stealth such an asset on certain maps in certain situations. It's very easy with a ship like this, if it's played well, to murder a submarine who has overextended and screwed up. And it's, it's so, it's so, so uh, satisfying when you can step on the cockroach. A defense, LOL, you have none. Um, nothing meaningful. You're going to spend most of your time running around Shimakaze just like you did in Kagero and Yugumo with your AA turned off. And when you do turn it on, you're going to turn it on long enough to probably murder whatever fighter it is that might be spotting you, and then you're going to turn it back off again. Uh, this is not exciting. Don't get excited about this. Don't ever build for this. Don't invest any modules, flags, or skills in this. It's not going to get better. It's not significant enough to make a big difference in how the ship, uh, how you're going to build the captain or fit out, fit out the ship. This AA, as we've been saying up the line, it's good for killing fighters. It's really not good for killing bombers. You're really not going to get much of a chance to do any of that. All right, so let's come back to this screen. Let's hit the two things that are very simple first, and then we'll go back and we'll have a longer conversation about upgrades and captain skills. For starters, consumables. You've been a little spoiled, guys, because at tier 8 and 9, you had a choice between engine boost and torpedo reload. Oh, excuse me, between smoke between smoke and torpedo reload. Here back at tier 10, they've taken that away from you. It feels a little bad. I've often wondered how Shimakaze might play if she had access to torpedo reload booster. I sometimes think it would be a very, very valid upgrade for the ship, 
I mean, a valid option if they would add it to the ship. Because in the modern era of the game, Shimakaze is is still a good boat, but she's just so much less capable than she used to be because of submarines. So many players now take hydro because of submarines. Once they figure out there's a Shimakaze on that flank, somebody's going to have their hydro running. You're just going to get fewer torpedo hits. There are more hydro battleships in the game now than there ever have been. And it, it, if it absolutely impacts the, the, the effectiveness that you can have, the, 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 the damage you can extract, the, the, the good stuff you can get out of the hull of a Shimakaze. And it's unfortunate. Um, so there are times that I think that they, I wish Wargaming would experiment with this. And I'll say this. If there comes a time in the future after this video that they are able to, they decide they want to do it, and they put Torpedo Reload Booster in this slot, just like they did at Tier 8 and 9, I would encourage you to try it out on occasion because I think there are times that it's the right play. However, in randoms, I'll say the same thing that I said, you know, for Kagero and Yugumo, it's a huge risk if there's a carrier or any kind of planes in that game, and you're going to see some of that in the sample game coming up soon. But here, of course, Shimakaze, you don't have that choice. You're stuck at the same consumables you had at Tier 5, 6, and 7. You're back to the exact same consumables here at Tier 10. You're getting damage control party, smoke, and engine boost, and that's it. You don't get a choice. Signal flags, I would encourage you to run Juliet Charlie if you've got them, Sierra Mike as well, as well as November Foxtrot, and then, of course, the Holy Trinity of uh, maximizing my fire and or flood damage. If you don't have the any X-ray flags, you'll be fine. I don't think this is a big deal. You're not going to get, you're going to fire the guns fairly infrequently. So if you don't run these, you're really not missing very much. But if you do have the Juliet Whiskey Una ones, I would encourage you to do it here. Every little bit of flood chance helps. Um, the smoke flag, again, as we've said before, handy in a div if you're going to be running with some div mates and smoking for them. Some value here. Otherwise, you're playing solo. Wouldn't waste your time with it. And all of the, the, the damage control flags, the flood less and burn less, I wouldn't bother with. The ram flag, maybe, right? I mean, in a world where you're going to be hunting, potentially hunting submarines, sometimes I've I've needed this ram flag to maybe potentially survive ramming an opposing submarine. So, okay, some a valid choice here if you are uh, of, so, of that so inclined. But I don't necessarily know that I would do that all the time. Okay, so now let's talk about the harder decisions you're going to have to make. I think the upgrades are a little easier. We'll start there. For starters in slot one, main armaments mod is you're going you're gonna to want to do this. You've been doing this probably the entire way up the line. Secondary magazine and DCP are just not good choices for the ship. As soon as you get shot at, if your torpedoes are on reload, they have the potential to get in-capped and reset your reload timer. You do not want that. You want to run main armaments mod as much as possible. Here in slot two, um, I'm running engine room protection. I could see a very valid case for engine boost, especially given that the speed of Shimakaze is one of her, her assets. So if you want to plug this in here, you go right ahead. If you don't want to spend the coal or don't have the coal to spend, I would run engine room protection here. Don't run damage control. It's not relevant. Um... Here in uh, slot three, you have some potential options. You could be looking at main battery mod, aiming, or torpedo tubes. I think any one of those three is a valid pick for the ship. But again, we are a torpedo-centric destroyer. I would strongly encourage you to take torpedo tubes modification one. Um, again, it's reducing that in cap. It's speeding up the torpedo tube traverse, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. And then that extra bit of torpedo speed never hurts. Here in slot four, propulsion mod one, in my mind, is the way to go. The depth charges is overkill. You're putting so many bombs in a stick, you just won't get a lot of value out of this. Steering gears, the steering, the rudder ship is already three seconds. What, you want more? It's not necessary. And again, damage control on a ship this fragile is just, this, this is not, not valid pick. So really only one good option here, and that's propulsion mod number one. Here in slot five, you're absolutely going to want concealment. Don't even look at the rest of this. Just take concealment and move on. You need the stealth with your health pool. You need the stealth. Your stealth is about the only thing that's going to keep you in some of these games, okay? Now here in slot six, you have a couple of, Potential options. You have one more available option that you didn't have at Yugamo. We, we kind of made the case for main battery versus torpedo tubes down at Yugamo. Um, but here, of course, at Tier 10, you have the option for Shimakaze's unique upgrade. If you don't have the unique upgrade, if you don't have the research points or whatever, I would strongly encourage you to just run Torpedo Tubes Mod 2. This would be my default choice, okay? Um, main battery Mod 3, we talked about it earlier. Shimakaze's not a gunboat. She's not ever going to be a gunboat. No matter how hard you build this ship for a gunboat, it's never going to be a gunboat. Don't do this to yourself, okay? You don't want the gun range. This is this is actively trying to get yourself killed faster. And again, auxiliary, this is not going to get you anything. So really the choices are torpedo tubes modification two. This should be your default, if you, especially if you're just coming to the ship for the first time. Or if you've got the research points, we can talk about the legendary upgrade, the unique upgrade. I'm running this unique upgrade. I really like this one. It speeds up your torpedo reload a little faster. You see there, I'm getting 25% torpedo reload uh, extra versus 15 up here. 
at mod torpedo mod two. So that saves me about fifteen. I think I think about fifteen to sixteen seconds on my torpedo reload. Over the course of a long match, that can add up. That adds up to sometimes a whole other torpedo salvo that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Um, the trick here is that your torpedoes traverse very, very slowly, and it increases the risk of your torpedo tubes getting knocked out. Now, you've counteracted that risk back here with torpedo tubes mod uh, one. You're counteracting 40% of it here. You're taking a 50% penalty, and you're counteracting 40% of it back here. And then by the time you take some captain skills, you're sort of making up for some of this. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that risk of torpedo tubes becoming incapacitated. The real struggle here is that torpedo tube traverse speed, right? Minus 70% means those torpedo tubes will now turn about as fast as your gun turrets. They, ve they move very slow. So it makes it very challenging if you're working, if, try, try making last second maneuvers, trying to get a torpedo salvo off in a big hurry, like yikes. Um, this will work against you. This definitely takes away from the knife fighter aspect of the ship. If you find yourself falling in love with the F3 torpedoes, I would strongly encourage you not to run this upgrade. I think, it's, I think, I think they work against each other, personally. It's not something I've ever tried. But just looking at it on paper, I think it's a huge risk to have eight kilometer torpedoes that you have to spend this long trying to get them on, get them aimed. I would not, I would not risk it. Okay. Um, with the longer range torpedoes, you're able to play farther back, plan your attacks a little more carefully. The the extra time you spend getting your your launchers online is a lot less detrimental. I don't think it's as big a deal. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommended configuration. Now, captain skills. We've got a lot of choices, right? My my default, of course, ordinarily when I build a destroyer would be preventive maintenance, last stand, survivability, and concealment. As you can see, I've sacrificed survivability in this build. Uh, we did this at Kagero for similar reasons. Here at Shimakaze, it's it's uh, I could might be able to scrounge up the points to pull it off, but I don't think that I can, right? I'm running a 21 point captain, and if I want concealment and RPF and adrenaline rush and fill the tubes, um, it's very difficult to pick up this last three point skill and get everything I want along the way. I'd have to give up both of these skills to grab this. So I really think you want preventive maintenance out of the first row. I don't think you care about the turret traverse. I wouldn't invest here. You need the points elsewhere. Liquidator, if you've got a spare point, this is not a bad skill, but you're Japanese. Your torpedoes are probably going to flood anyway. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, tier two, again, I don't recommend demolition expert. Um, extra heavy ammunition is nice if you really want the depth charge bonus, but I don't recommend it. I really think you definitely want last stand. And I think you, I would highly encourage you to take swift fish. Now, there's, a va there's an argument to be made, and, and this is, would be a valid build in my mind as I sit here looking at it, to ditch priority target and swift fish, put those points into survivability expert, and then take that one point and dump it down in, I don't know, consumable specialist or liquidator or something down here on tier one. I could see that. I like this build. These are my choices, but if you, wanna, if you want the extra health, there's, I, I think it's a totally valid choice. Go right ahead. Don't, don't feel bad. I simply feel like this is a third, this is a, of, of the, the skills on the, on the tier three row, you definitely want fill the tubes. Like this would be my default pick every time, a drill and rush right behind. I'm gonna get shot at, I'm gonna take damage. This just makes me a little more lethal, a little better as the, the longer a match goes on. Pretty much nothing else in this row gets me all that excited other than survivability expert. You don't really care about FHE. You don't really care about um, more gun, more gun power. You're not ever going to be a gunboat, and the extra consumables doesn't really get you a whole lot. It's just an extra smoke. So there'll be times that you might wish you had it, but probably not enough to invest three skill points. Um, top of top of the tree here again. Like I said, I would strongly. I mean, you basically have to build the ship for concealment. You have to put four points here, in my opinion. We've been talked. We've talked about radio location as we've gone up and up, up and down the line. For Shimakaze, I love this skill. It allows you to get torpedo strikes off against things that you know are there but can't spot. You at least know where to aim the torpedoes. Sometimes you will get you're like, oh, surprise, I got him. You know, I think I think you want this skill at Shimakaze. I think it's very very valid. If you don't like the skill, you don't think you need it. Um, you definitely don't want gun range. Don't take this. However. Uh, Swift and Silence would be an excellent skill for you. A little more speed when you're not spotted. You're already very stealthy. More speed to get around the map. More speed to keep you away from the things that might spot you. This would be an excellent skill choice. So don't discount that. You don't want Fearless Brawler. And even though Dazzle has been buffed, I still don't think this is necessarily a great pick for you. Um, I think this. I think Dazzle is more of a, of a gunboaty skill, right? I don't think you would necessarily want this on a Torpedo Destroyer. So this is my build. The only thing that I kind of look at and go, man, I wish I could squeeze survivability expert in here. I think that's a valid, another valid way you can play around with it. Maybe some of these one point skills you can swap out. I really think you want at a minimum preventive, preventive maintenance last stand. Remember, this is also helping keep your torpedoes from getting in capped, right? Because of your module that you, that you increase that chance. You want this, you want last stand, you want adrenaline rush, you want fill the tubes, you want concealment. 
And I think you want rate of location, but I definitely think you want concealment. Do not give up concealment. You pretty much can't afford to. All right, let's go look at some sample gameplay, and then we'll come back here and say goodbye to the Japanese torpedo destroyers. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to our little sample game here in Tier 10 Japanese destroyer Shimakaze. I, um, this is not my best game in Shimakaze, but it took me long enough to get a decent enough result that I'm just going to run with it. I'm not kidding you guys, and we kind of talked about this a little bit in the earlier video. The current meta of the game is not kind to this ship, and... Um, you're going to see me struggle at various points, and some of what's going to happen that I'm going to be able to, some of the torpedo hits I'm going to land are going to be like, oh, that was clever. Then some of them are going to be like, oh, that was luck. And let's be honest, that's kind of how torpedo just, tor torpedoes work on occasion. So spawning here into the south side of mountain range, I take a quick look around my team, and I realize very quickly the Minotaur, who's right behind me, is a radar Minotaur. I really like that opportunity, so I'm going to kind of communicate with him here in chat in just a moment and say, look, man, stick with me, and I'm going to get you some smoke as we get close to this cap. My intention is to move up next to this island here and then lay him a nice little smoke screen, kind of a kind of just leading up to the cap. I want to give him plenty of room to, if he wants to hide by island, he can, behind the island, he can. If he wants to have a place that he can turn uh, off and bail off to the south, he can. And, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the goal here. So I'm slowing down. I'm letting him get a little close. When he gets within about two clicks, I think, is when I go ahead and start the smoke screen. Now, a small error uh, that I probably made here, I should have slowed down sooner and sped up and probably popped a, like, maybe even popped a speed boost right here so that he would have had a longer, like, a, a, a physically longer smoke, a smoke cloud to work with. But I do give him at least something to go with. Uh, he gets, you know, I get my 10, 12 seconds of smoke out the door. He sails into that. And uh, he's got his radar up here next to the cap. Now I'm going to pause real briefly uh, because one of the things that I didn't really have time to, to get into was looking over the team lineups. Uh, for starters, I have at least one radar. That's the Nevsky. I got to be frosty for that guy. The gearing has the same spotting as, as myself. Of course, assuming uh, he has, is he a legendary? Let's have a peek. He is not. This is one of the things I like about this mod. I can check and it'll show me that he is not a legendary gearing. So 5-9 there. So I actually outspot both opposing destroyers. I outspot the Bilal and the U-190 and I are about the same. So I, you know, again, we've talked before about kind of the advantage that Shimakaze has. This is, this is one of those things uh, that you, you want to check for is are you going to have some potting advantage or not? Um, do have it here. That's nice. So we'll have to see if we can maximize that. The planes are going to be a problem. Yorktown is an irritatingly competent carrier uh, when played well. She certainly has the tools to be a competent carrier. And so I'm going to have to uh, keep my eyes open for that. Two early racks at the Ohio here, just sort of spreading them out. I'm, again, as we talked about in the video, I'm running the 12-kilometer torpedoes. Early Lexington bombers picking up the Akizuki. I'm trying desperately to avoid um, these Louisiana bombers. The Aki's AA takes out the defensive fighters that my Lex had dropped over the cap. And so now... Louisiana bombers out just actually now wandering inside of my AA range, but of course my AA is off as it should be when Shimakaze. You don't ever really want to run with your AA on just for, for grins and grins and stuff. Minotaur puts his radar up, picks up the Akazuki, picks up the Balao, starts trying to put some shells down range, but inexplicably he is still moving in there. I'm a little baffled in a moment i'm going to turn around and look back and go wait a minute what are you doing out of your smoke cloud and uh and he is out of his smoke cloud i i am like whoa 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 there's three different battleships up here two of them with huge guns what are you do what are you what are you doing what is happening right now why are i left you oh i left you smoke so this wouldn't happen and yeah so Earlier, I have sometimes castigated myself for not playing like a teammate in World of Warships. But as you can clearly see, some play, sometimes playing like a teammate doesn't always work out. Now, one other thing I want to point out here, um, you might have noticed it while I was ranting. Um, I launched two racks at that Ohio early, and then after he had chosen a course over to the islands, he got the third rack um, pointed over there towards the west that I had held in reserve. You can sort of see those torpedoes on the extreme right of your screen. Well, they're just now to the left center. 
that's one of the things you know, we talked about it down with Fubuki, with Akizuki. Holding that third rack is something that you're going to commonly see me do when I play Shimakaze. Is it always the right choice? No, it isn't always the right choice. But it's the choice that I will make frequently because I find that it gives me lots of flexibility. These two rack, well, this these two racks are going out. One for the Ohio and one to the north side of the island. Look, thinking the Colombo might wander into it, but also the Akizuki is still over there somewhere now. Let's talk about this, the strategic situation real quick. I want you guys to have a look at the map. All right. In the bottom right-hand corner of the map, you can clearly see this flank is going to go badly for my team. I am here. I am on the A cap. I've just finished capping A. Yay. Go little Shimakaze. But look at the rest of my team. The Lexington is obviously not going to stay. He needs to take his hull somewhere else with this many enemy ships that might catch a glimpse of him. The Montana in the center is literally all by himself in the center, presumably. Um, and then the Kerr first and the Montana down on the I line are so far away from the enemy ships, they are effectively worthless. They're like the next best thing to 20 kilometers away from all, all the targets. So I'm up here spotting, but there's they have nothing to shoot at, nothing, nothing they can effectively do damage to. It's just me. As soon as the enemy team spots me, I'm going to have the better part of four to five ships shooting at me. And you know what that means. It's time to get the hell out of here. So we are, I, I basically, I'm writing this off. I'm like, nope, I'm going to take me and my torpedoes in my hull and we're going south and we are going to look for opportunities to kite this flank. Under no circumstances are we going to chill out here and, and hang out. Not going to happen. This, these irritating Louisiana bombers are going to pick me up and try to make a run. Blessedly, the Lexington uh, does drop me a fighter. Sub comes in with a ping, misses. Louisiana Bombs gets one in the bow for a solid full pin because American HE. I do get one accidental torpedo into the Shimikaze. Again, I'm not going to complain. And if you have a peek, you can sort of get the sense that I might get one into the defense back there. We're about to lose sight of him, but he's sort of turning in. Yep, there we go. I get one right into the bow of the defense uh, before they run out of steam. Torpedoes astern. The Balao's got his torpedoes in the water. He's trying to ping me to get them to home, but I'm just, again, I'm bailing. I have no intention of hanging out over here. Blessedly, their radar is not on this flank. They, they're wholly reliant on the planes to spot me, and uh, I am not interested in giving them that opportunity. With my third rack coming available, I'm going to dump it out there on the assumption that Colombo is going to keep creeping south. The other two racks, you can see at the bottom of the screen, are about 10, 12 seconds away from uh, coming up. They are going to go into that smoke uh, that the uh, the Akazuki is chilling in, and we'll see what we can get out of those. I think the defense is going to wander into there. Nope, the defense is turning back over towards the two line. But I'm still going to put my torpedoes into that smoke on the hope that I might manage to catch the Akazuki with another torpedo. I'm trying to, I'm looking at the map going, okay, we really need this Lexington to move. There's Right now, there's nothing stopping these guys from continuing to push south because the Kerfers and the Montana are only in range of the enemy because the enemy has driven towards them. At no point have they, well, the Kerfers is sort of slowly kind of making a bit of a move. But basically, the Montana is not interested in closing with anybody. So they're, they remain pretty ineffective. Six and a half minutes gone. It's even. Three ships apiece. Nobody's capped B. My team has sort of steamrolled over the sea cap, which is nice to see. But there are a whole bunch of ships on this half, enemy ships on this half of the map, and it's not going to go well for us if I hang out here. 4501 is going to creep back north. The Colombo has reversed, so those torpedoes... I had sort of maybe hoped that maybe those torpedoes might wander into him, but he pulled the handbrake and backed off. That's not going to be a thing. One of the unfortunate detriments of the 12-kilometer... Uh, the 12 kilometer torpedoes versus the 20s. The defense is backed off. The Ohio is back there in smoke somewhere. The Yorktown laid smoke for his buddies so they could retreat a little bit. And so now it's just me and the, 20, uh, the 4501 again out here looking for the Aki and the Balao. Now, one or both of those guys, I'm expecting them to be headed to B. They don't know it, but they have a clear open road in that direction. Quite literally nothing over there, but you can see my RPF pointing over to my right-hand side into the cap. That's very clearly one of those two ships, possibly even both of them, um, chilling out over there. If the Lex decides to take his planes up, then uh, he might catch a glimpse of them for me. Colombo's trying to move up again. I launched that first rack thinking he was going to turn deeper into the islands, but he does something I don't expect. He comes back to port to turn into the cap. And so now I'm trying to gauge how quickly he's turning, trying to lead these... 
Uh, I'm going to end up cutting it just a little shorter than that and kind of lead them about right there. Now, the Ohio is pretty clearly trying to make that turn around. I'm going to lead these into the gap as far up to that island as I can in the hope that I might try and catch him either coming straight towards me or turning back to his northeast and vacating out of that gap. So that's one of the instances you see there. I've got all three racks in the water within about 15 to 20 seconds of each other, and that is not normal, but that was an opportunity that I think warranted, uh, warranted what we've done. Again, that third rack gives you such amazing tactical flexibility that um, being able to take advantage of it when you can is is really critical in my mind. Now, the Colombo literally made that turn and stopped. So the first and second rack I left for that guy are going to miss. But luckily for me, the Ohio has played his part to perfection. He was trying to use that island to get cover from the Kerr first. He succeeded in that part. But in so doing, he has wandered directly into where I left him a little present. And um, there we go. Now, I've got a little fighter cover over my head, and so now I want to move up. Did you catch it earlier? The Akazuki. Yep, there he is on 1,500 HP. That is a one salvo kill for my guns if I can get up here and, and get rid of him. And right now, we need the kill. Yes, we're a ship up, but I still don't. Man, this team is playing so squirrely, I just don't trust it. This salvo, I actually shorted just a little bit. It's going to fall a little farther astern than I would like, and I'm only going to land two of the two of the six shells. But I'm going to get a whole bunch of shells here. As it turns out, the Lexington's going to come in and pick up that kill. Fine, I don't care. I just wanted to make sure we secured the kill one way or another. I'm going to blow smoke to make sure the Colombo doesn't get free shots at me because SAP hurts. And blessedly, I managed to get away from all of that. Speed boost is ticking, and now it means it's time to go back to B and go Bilal hunting. He's out there all by himself. The Nevsky is on the A line. Their Louisiana has backed way off the cap. Their Goliath has backed way off the cap. At the moment, at this exact moment, we have a two-ship lead and nearly 200 points. That feels pretty solid. Health-wise, though, we are upside down. They're, they're, you can see that their, their team is falling back, trading health for board position, as we commonly talk about in competitive warships. So they're preserving their health and choosing to give up the ground. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that, A, this Bilal is hung out to dry out here all by himself. I need to go find him and murder him and cap B. Colombo narrows the gap by putting our, uh, our, our forward Montana out of the game, which, again, not shocking. He had pushed far too, up, far too far forward for the health pool that he had. And so now it's time to go submarine hunting. The Lexington throwing, doing us a solid, dropping planes over this guy's head as he goes for a torpedo strike on the Colombo. The U-4501, I believe, he's not on the surface. I'm a little surprised at this. He could be on the surface over there and literally could be capping A at the same time that he's trying to um, trying to torpedo the Colombo, but uh, no. So the Bilal comes topside and finds me waiting for him. He's going to get a couple of salvos off my guns for his trouble. Unfortunately, they're not amazingly good salvos. I get a little bit of damage on each one, two or three shells. He takes a fire. He has to put that out. The Sen Yang gets in on the action, but he gets deep enough just in time to avoid that salvo there. Now, this guy has plenty of battery. He can stay down for a while. So now I basically have to I have to go to him and bring him uh, my beautiful Japanese depth charges if I want to murder him. The Yorktown has been paying attention. You can see his rocket plane starting to come in. But again, our Lexington had some fighter cover-up that just now vanished. And for some reason, the Bilal comes back to the surface. I cannot explain what is happening, but he does come back to the surface. And uh, it's going to be the last. It's going to be the last thing he does in this game. I'm going to get a chunk of damage, but it's the Sin Yang that's going to get the kill, as the Sin Yang also takes the brunt of the Yorktown torpedo strike just off my stern. He and I are going to grab B, and again, our ship our ship lead stays at one ship here, and I have a couple of a couple of caps, and um, life feels pretty good. All right, so now. There's only eight minutes left in this game. I'm going to pause it real briefly. There's only eight minutes left in this game. The enemy team has five, excuse me, six surviving ships. At least three of them, more likely four, are on the A or B lines. Look at the many map in the bottom right. Look where the Louisiana, the Goliath, and the Nevsky are. They are pushed so far off the cap. They are not going to be relevant for a while, okay? The defense and the Colombo are still relevant at A, and our Kerfers and our Montana, who refuse to get within 12 kilometers of any opposing ship, continue to derp around in the islands and pretty much don't seem to be super effective over there. The Sinyang and I, then, are going to try and make a play for killing this Colombo. Now, I have two different ways that I can play this. 
You can see there as I've got, I'm locked out of the Columbo. My reticle is moving closer to him. That tells me he's slowing down. I can push north. I could push north and go around the north side of this island, closer to the enemy ships, closer to the radar, closer to the planes, and try and get torpedoes into him from there. I choose to do the exact opposite. I'm going to follow the Sin Yang to the south and fire torpedoes uh, at the Colombo from there. I'm going to intentionally put a distance between me and the things that might forcibly detect me to try and preserve the health and uh, hull of my ship as long as possible. Our salmon had grossly overextended. Again, he was up on the sea line. He is now dead. And just like that, we are now suddenly down a ship and upside down on points despite having a little more control of the board than the opposing team. Sin Yang's going to smoke and try to farm some damage off of this Columbo. I'm trying to cut in front of this guy so my torpedoes aren't wasted into his hull. Of course, team damage no longer a thing. I wouldn't kill him, but they would be a wasted salvo, and that would toss me in 100 seconds to get back. Now, you can see here his engines are starting to come forward again because the reticle is moving closer to him. So I'm going to intentionally leave these torpedoes one in front of him and one right on him. I'm looking for two opportunities there. One that he remains, he stays at low speed and sort of kind of stays stationary because we've seen this Columbo do a lot of stationary play and or he pushes, he finally turns his engine on, he tries to move up and turn towards the Montana or the Kerr first and, and make that happen and then in which case he will probably turn into the first salvo and those will hit him full on and that's I'm, that's what I banked those two salvos on. So we'll see see if I'm, I'm right. It looks like he's turned his engines on now Second salvo that was aimed at the stationary marker is going to miss, but the salvo that I led him with is going to get two hits there and put him out as we get back to parity on ships. The opposing defense is charging our Kerr first so he can get his um, goofy torpedoes into the water. Looks like he's going to end up winning that duel because our Kerr first doesn't understand the opponent he's up against. And our Montana uh, apparently missed his opportunity to murder that guy a moment ago. Louisiana takes out the Cien Yang, which is always fun because planes are awesome. And so now we find ourselves upside down a ship and looking at what could be a very, very bad loss. The Montana cutting back towards mid. I'm spotting for him. He's got really good shots on either this Nevsky. He does start putting shells out, uh, shells out in that direction, which is good. I'm going to try and leave some torpedo presence for this Nevsky. That's the third rack that I held in reserve from earlier. It's available. I'm going to lead that one on the assumption that he's going to go bow into the Montana. But you can see he's continuing to maneuver. Battle ends in five minutes. He's actually going to turn a little farther south, and I'm going to leave him a rack here in just a moment. And you can see there, as the reticle moves, he's turning back to port. So we're going to leave that reticle and try and sneak in a torpedo hit there. They know where I am now. Very clearly, I am in, uh, I am in A as I'm leaving both racks, actually, for the Nevsky. I want to make sure we get something into that guy because the Montana not doing himself any favors. The defense finally wins his 1v1 duel with the tier 10 battleship. Amazeballs. Love all of that. <sighs> As now I am hunted by the Yorktown bombers. Yorktown probably lurking in the one islands along the 1-2 line off to my starboard side. That seems to be where the planes are coming from. He hasn't spotted me yet, and I want this cap. So I'm going to burn my last smoke to make sure that he can't reset me. We are going to get one torp into the Nevsky. Yorktown is not going to get this salvo off. He's going to decline. He's going to leave the planes circling me, though, because I have no help over here. As the Montana, like, I don't know what that guy's doing. Grounding himself or something? I don't know. But he's just driving these bombers in circles over my head, keeping me lit for his teammates, which is honestly the best thing he could be doing. He's doing the smart thing. So at this moment, I want you, I'm going to pause real briefly. I, I want you guys to check kind of the confluence of things that are about to happen over the next few minutes. There is three and a half minutes left in this game. And I, I realize now I should probably move that timer up a little bit, but it's a little in the way of the B cap. Um, we're down two ships, but we have an incredibly narrow lead on points. I am now trapped between three ships with planes overhead. I pretty much can't escape. All right. So I have to do what I can. I finished the cap. The Goliath or the Nevsky, one of them, blows his first salvo trying to hit me. I'm now under the guns, I think, of the defense secondaries or something right there. Yep, those are the defense's secondaries popping off on me. As again, the Yorktown bombers are just flying overhead, keeping me lit for this defense. Now, I have two... I have one rack of torpedoes available. 
I'm gonna see what I can do with these here. Now, at this instant, all three racks are available. So he's gonna get one aimed right down his throat. There goes 4K as he is assuming, as I assume he's going to come straight towards me. And I'm gonna put one around the other side of the island on the assumption that he's gonna use that island to sneak past it and, um, and try to get away from you. But it turns out it's even worse because now, have a peek. Did you see it? He grounded himself. He grounded himself. And so now, He's literally sitting broadside against my very first torpedo salvo. So the defense is dead. I am not wasting my third rack there. I'm getting shot by the Louisiana as the Yorktown bombers continue to hound me. There goes the defense. So just briefly, we're back down to two ships. Big salvo from somebody. I don't know. I've lost. At this point, I'm enemy number one to the opposing team. I've sort of lost track as to who's shooting at me. Would you pick up kill number three? The Louisiana is turning in. His bombers are going to come back in a minute. I managed to dodge some of it. <sighs> the planes, the incessant, endless, ridiculous parade of planes in this game. But what's actually going to kill me in a minute is not the planes. It's going to be the spotting that the planes provide. As you would expect, right? This is exactly why plane spotting of destroyers is so heinously, obscenely powerful. My last rack going on Louisiana. The bombers are going to drop me and miss. Or they're not going to hit me that hard. Yeah, they miss completely. And then I have to try and wait for it to not get spotted for the Louisiana Salvo. But it's not going to happen because the Lexington planes are back. I'm sorry, the Yorktown planes are back already. And of course, now I've got everyone to kill me. And there we go. So now the Lexington down to the last man. As the game is tied with 90 seconds to play. Right there, the game is tied. It's 716 points apiece. But look at the map. Louisiana's not in the cap yet. The Goliath is busy trying to chase the carrier that he can't even see. He's, he knows the carrier's down there somewhere, but he can't find him yet. And so now I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm going to vent a little bit in chat. Like, you know, like if only I'd gotten something out of these two tier 10 battleships that hung, hung behind me all game. Um, but as it is, we're actually going to win this game anyway, guys, because we're going to win this game because I came over and capped A at the end. And right now, we're ticking up two caps, and the opposing team is only ticking up one. And as our lead grows to about 25 points, all that Lexington has to do is not, is not die. Even if the Louisiana makes it into the cap, all he'll do is stop our points gain. The lead will both, be both teams will be ticking up one cap each, and we will be able to finally... At long last, after a full 20 minutes, yikes, win this game. This was a really frustrating game to play. Um, it came down to the end. I was shocked when I realized we were going to win this game. And I, I'm still a little shocked even watching the replay because the battleship play that we got this game was so atrociously bad. It feels like we deserved to lose this game. And yet, we managed to control the board between myself, the Xianang, and the submarines. We managed to control enough of the board long enough that we were able to eke out a win here on Mountain Range. Yikes. 123,000 damage is not going to win any damage awards, but I'm pretty happy with that result based on, uh, <laughs> based on the matchmaking and the teammates I was up against in this particular game. 1.4 million credits, yes. I am running the big blue uh, credit enhancer, so that's what you're seeing, seeing there. 2K base XP, again, that's the main reason I'm showing you this result, okay? Shimakaze able to come in, take advantage of her stealth, pick up caps, do a little spotting. I don't think I got a ton of spotting damage, only about 50K, less than 50K, right? Not even 45,000 spotting damage, but some good torpedo hits. I managed to land over 100,000 damage in torpedoes. Um, not much in flooding, not shocking, really. Most people will put those floods out right away and use the guns in the right situations against the submarines and the low health destroyers to land some important, important damage. Um, but yeah, very proud of the XP result. We had two full caps, I believe. It should be two and a partial. Yep, two full capture flags, one partial, three kills, um, a whole pile of damage, a little bit of spotting damage, even a little bit of AA damage. Nothing amazing there, right? And mostly about the board control. Shimikaze using her presence and her torpedoes to, to try and zone out opposing ships and just uh, be relevant as long as possible and stay in the game. But of course, as you saw there at the end, once the opposing team has a rough idea of where you are and still has a carrier, still has planes available, 
you are eventually going to go down because they can spot you and your stealth is literally one of the only things you have going for you. You don't have the A to really defend yourself from proper bombers. And once you're out of smoke in that game, I part- I was then, um, then you're pretty well hosed, but I sacrificed my last smoke for that last cap. And that last cap was the difference in this particular game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there we go. There's our look at the Japanese torpedo destroyers. We've concluded now we've had a look at tier 10s Shimakaze, the line is basically complete, unless I decide I want to come back someday and do the super ships. And we'll, eh, maybe we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I hope you guys have enjoyed these. Um, these ships are still fun to play, but they're very challenging to play in the modern state of World of Warships. Submarines have driven so many players to take hydro acoustic search on their consumables lists that uh, landing torpedoes reliably is sometimes very, very challenging. So if you're going to play these ships, you need to go in with the expectation that some games you're going to have great damage totals and some games you are not. They're almost, I won't call them matchmaker dependent. I'd say their damage is sometimes a little matchmaker dependent and certainly a little dependent on the intelligence and tenacity of the uh, of the opposing team. Let's put it that way. In the meantime, guys, appreciate you watching. I hope these learn to play videos are helping you out. Y'all have a great, great day. Wash your hands, be safe. I'll catch you next time.